I'm going to dive into a question today that few people are willing to fully talk about. And that includes members of the Florida legislature, that includes other politicians, that includes a lot of citizens out there. Which is, what happens to Florida health freedom without Governor DeSantis? That is our question of the day. We're going to be diving into it. And most people don't want to look at this. They don't want to examine this reality. They don't want to think about it. Uh, I don't know whether it's just a human tendency to not want to deal with the future, to not deal with reality, or whether people are just in denial or people are scared of what they might see. But for whatever reason, very few people want to think about what can happen to Florida health freedom if if we lose the influence of Governor DeSantis. So what would really happen without the governor being there? And what would all of us do uh, to really make ourselves... Uh, protect it, how, what would happen to health freedom, and what should we be doing now. All right, let's jump into it. As always, not legal advice. We're just discussing general topics for your education, entertainment, and then also you can use this to consult your own legal counsel for specific issues. So we'll be talking some about Florida legislation. We'll be talking about what's out there. Uh, get your own detailed advice from your own attorney. Uh, there are terrible laws sitting on the books here in Florida. And if you've been following our work at the American Freedom Information Institute, you know about those, right? We're talking about forced uh, treatment against your will in the event of a public health emergency. Uh, this is 381 Also, forced examination, forced testing, uh, forced quarantine, and forced isolations. And the Florida version of these laws have limited to no due process. Uh, So much like the red flag laws, and we did a video on the the channel here about those, uh, very similar with our health freedom laws. There's no direct mechanism uh, to run to the courts, right? You can't just go out and grab a judge and say, hey, I don't like the way I'm being treated, right? The the statute does not directly provide that avenue. You have to figure out that. Now, are there constitutional questions with it? Are there potential issues? Of course there are. Uh, But you're talking about a long road, especially if we get into another public health emergency and the state wants to start uh, forcing treatments, then what would you do? And what would your answer be during that time Uh, As a citizen, as an individual, if you suddenly were required to take a treatment against your will, would you have time to retain an attorney? Would you have the money? Would you be able to get to the courthouse? Would you spend the time and effort uh, in the meantime while potentially losing your job, losing access to go out? Maybe you can't even get to your bank, right? A lot of bad things could be happening while this is all getting sorted out. Also, Florida, in addition to that, uh, there's a judge's guide that was published. Now, this is prior to 381-00315 being amended in November of 2021, Uh, but judges are speaking about a section which was not amended, Uh, and what they say is under this other general authority, not the 381-00315 authority, but the general authority under 381, uh, that perhaps the uh, state health officer could order vaccinations uh, for just general public health planning, right? So uh, these terrible laws sit on the books. Patient access. Uh, we have the Patient's Bill of Rights and we have the new No Patient Left Alone Act. Both of those acts are conditional, right? There are lots of ways someone could be cut off from their loved one. For instance, under the No Patient Left Alone Act, you have to meet certain criteria in order to be in a situation where a loved one gets access to a patient. Uh, One of those conditions, it has to be a major medical decision, right? So uh, we could see situations here where a hospital could be taking what you or I might consider to be a major medical decision, something that's important to us, important to our health, important to our uh, long-term well-being. We may think it's major. They may say it's routine. Uh, including treatments for, you know, common uh, viruses that are circulating, right? You may have to go on to their treatment system uh, and you may not have a a loved one there to make a say because they may say it's just a routine thing uh, and not a major medical decision. Therefore, we do not have to give access under the No Patient Left Alone Act. Also, under the No Patient Left Alone Act, uh, visitors or these loved ones that can get access to a patient 
have to comply with hospital uh, protocols. Uh, so that's the masking, that's the uh, gown wearing, some other things that are po potentially there, right? And sometimes that may be a problem, may not be a problem, right? I mean, you may have somebody who has a medical issue uh, wearing a mask and now they can't get in to see their loved one. Uh, because they're being denied access again. See, these, these laws are not absolute. And in many ways, as we've discussed, these Florida laws are pretty darn bad. Um, but they're not being used right now, uh, which is really, you know, pro-citizen, right? The fact that they're really not enforcing some of these laws. Some of the hospitals are using every bit of their rights to enforce care the way they want and to make sure that individuals don't exercise these rights. But from a state perspective, uh, we don't see uh, tremendous action uh, to force treatments, to force examinations, to force testings, right? Um, so we're not seeing that. It was printed on an airport traveler form that was used in 2020. Uh, the state explicitly had people traveling to Florida sign a form saying that they would, uh, that the state of Florida had the ability to do all that laundry list of things, quarantine, isolation, examination, testing, treatment. Uh, and back in 2021, there was still, or 2020, there was still a statutory period, uh, power to vaccinate. And that appeared on the form as well. So the state is well aware uh, within the health department that this authority exists. Uh, it's just not being used, right? Because the state health officer slash surgeon general is the same person serves at the pleasure of the governor and uh, the current state health officer doesn't seem to be in favor of using these powers at this time for this situation of course that could all be changed in a moment right uh something different could come along something new could come along and the state health officer could quickly change their position or change their views on things uh, but right now they're not being used which really has lulled people into a sense of complacency because these laws could be activated at any time, right? And you have to think about when would they most likely be activated. Um, maybe a new emergency comes around that looks different than the last one. Uh, and, and there's, you know, just like we saw, uh, the president felt like he was boxed into certain responses to the last uh, pandemic and emergency. Maybe the governor feels boxed into certain solutions. Maybe a state health officer feels the same way. Right, they they're sitting there dormant, and they could be activated at any time. And the problem for us as citizens is, we don't know when that point of activation would be. Right, we don't know when they will hit the go button. Um, most people probably believe it's unlikely under Governor DeSantis. I would tend to agree. Uh, the problem and what we're talking about today is what happens in a Florida without Governor DeSantis, right? Then we don't know who's going to be pushing these buttons. We don't know how quickly uh, they're going to push these buttons, right? It could happen at any time. Uh, state agencies could be weaponized. They could be used to carry out treatments against people's wills, quarantines, isolations, all permitted under the Florida statute, right? Again, maybe some court battles on the constitutionality, uh, but these laws are sitting here on, on the books, and you can guess that these state agencies are going to look at their written authority and what the statute says they can do um, and may try to use that, barring uh, individuals coming up with constitutional challenges, right? So typically a, an agency and a government will follow uh, the statutory authority. Uh, they may or may not dive into an internal constitutional analysis whether they can do that which means these state agencies could be used against the people. They could start enforcing these programs. Uh, they could be a tool to take their rights from people. Meanwhile, the, the current check on that is Governor DeSantis, right? He doesn't want to use this because he doesn't seem to be in favor of it. But in a moment's notice, uh, those state agencies could change their viewpoint and change what they're doing, uh, not to mention the Board of Health. We did a separate video on medical freedom of speech, uh, why it's important to a free society and the medical practice. And, and that video also is on our YouTube channel. So I recommend you go check that out uh, and dive deeper in that topic if you haven't seen it yet. But this potential to use state agencies to carry out an agenda uh, to remove medical freedom remains a very real possibility because of the weaknesses 
within the Florida laws. So the one key to freedom here is Governor DeSantis. Uh, as the governor, as the executive, uh, he has executive power. And part of that typically is where do you focus your attention? What, what tools do you use? What levers do you pull, right? This is a traditional role of a governor. And the governor is not pulling these levers. They're looking for other alternatives to dealing with uh, the current medical situation, public health emergency, if you want to call it that. Uh, they're using other ways, right? And and they focus largely on voluntary treatments, education, uh, people voluntarily doing different things to try to minimize their risk, right? That is the strategy currently. Uh, but that's because we have a governor that largely supports individual choice. Not that another governor couldn't. The question is, would a governor that potentially follows Governor DeSantis... Uh, and this question becomes very real now that Donald Trump has hinted that he's a potential running mate for president in 2024, which gives us a very short window until uh, Governor DeSantis would potentially be promoted um, to a higher office. That, that raises the question of how long will this freedom work if that one key to freedom is no longer there? Uh, there seems to be no other clear statewide leader on health freedom here in Florida, right? While we have many uh, politicians that have come to prominence at the state level, and we do see some politicians who are speaking out on health freedom, the politicians that are speaking out heavily on health freedom do not appear to be the ones that have the party backing or the support to make a major run that would lead to a governorship. Now, of course, it's politics, right? Everything can change. Everything can shift very quickly. A lot of unusual things tend to happen in politics. But right at this moment, there doesn't appear to be any other clear leader on health freedom in Florida that is actually taking action for health freedom. We do have some people that talk about it, uh, some people that support it. But when we get to the wheels and the workings of the legislature, uh, we don't see these actual laws doing well and moving strongly. Uh, so Governor DeSantis appears to be the strongest leader on health freedom in the state, even though he has, in many opinions, left some unfinished business on the table. And it raises the question, what would the next governor do? We don't really have a good reading on the lieutenant governor, right? We haven't seen public statements uh, acknowledging what she would do with uh, health freedom. We don't, we don't know what that stance would be. And of course, if we go through an election, uh, we may have different lieutenant governor. Uh, if we're talking about Governor DeSantis potentially running for vice president in a couple of years or president, uh, you know, we may then uh, have a we have we may have a new lieutenant governor by that point, right? We may have had a switch, or we may have the same person who we just don't know. Uh, the real question is, what would the next governor do? And certainly, if DeSantis loses in the election, uh, we can guess that a different party that you know has nationally been very uh, anti-medical freedom may continue that tradition into their Florida policies, right? They may start activating these very laws we're talking about, uh, meaning that in a post-DeSantis world, uh, we are guessing that that's going to mean from executive power less medical freedom and less support to pass laws. Uh, how quickly could things change? I mean, things could change overnight, right? I mean, we're talking about a change of governor, Uh if Governor DeSantis got ill, if Governor DeSantis uh, got involved in some scandal and had to resign, if Governor DeSantis, again, ran, uh, ran successfully for another office, uh, these are all things that could happen, right? They've happened in the history of states before with governors, and we've had it with presidents. People could quickly leave uh, the employ, right? So things could change very, very quickly. Uh, and that's one of the reasons we want to be so focused on this issue and, and do what we can right now while the, while the getting is good, right? Uh, not rely on the fact the laws haven't been used and they're sitting there largely dormant. Now's the time to get them off the books before they could be used. Uh, so how do you deal with this reality? It's, it's wake-up call. Uh, it's time to tell your friends and neighbors. It's time to get people thinking. And this is perhaps one of the hardest parts right now in activism. Um, you know, the, the worst parts of some of the mandates, some of the push 
uh, is over, right? So we're in a relatively quieter period. Uh, so now the real question becomes, you know, how do we get people activated doing things now uh, to deal with a potential future reality? Uh, most people, unfortunately, wait until their house is on fire uh, and then think about fire suppression, right? Rather than being proactive and planning and putting resources in time to advance, the average person on both sides of the aisle seems to wait until things are bad, then acts, right? And we got to change that. We've got to act while things are okay uh, to really push things forward. Uh, yeah, that is going to be the key here for all of us to get to medical freedom, right? Is to take action and take action now. Uh, which is going to be beneficial in the future. But we've got to really connect ourselves with those future possibilities, and we've got to internalize them. And we've got to allocate the resources because you know, the handwriting's on the wall here, folks. Right? There, there is no, there's no wondering here. Um, Florida's medical freedom laws are not very good. Uh, the key comes down to the governor. You can keep saying that we're going to keep, you know, electing similar governors who are going to protect medical freedom. And, you know, as a medical freedom activ activist, I hope people uh, will vote based on medical freedom. But there's no guarantee, right? And things do shift. So why is this statutory authority out there? Why are these bad laws out there, right? The time to fix this now because without Governor DeSantis, we really have no idea what's going to happen to medical freedom. And it could change overnight and we want to be ahead of that before that becomes a problem it's our sean thanks for tuning in folks i'll catch you guys again soon uh, check out some other videos here on the channel leave me some comments let me know what other issues you're thinking about and if i get enough comments maybe i'll do a piece on it talk to you soon